If you ask my personal opinion, I think that alien life is probably pretty common in the universe. It's entirely plausible that it exists within our own solar system, perhaps on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, which is thought to have vast ocean underneath its icy surface. But by alien life, I mean life like bacteria, molds, and other one-celled creatures. I think complex, intelligent life, like mammals, birds, and lizards, is probably very rare. And super-intelligent, space-faring life forms, like humans, is probably exceptionally rare. But this is not to say they don't exist. But whenever you read about alien visitations or see alien creatures in the movies, they're depicted as looking almost like humans. They may just have bigger eyes or bigger heads, or they look like some other animal that we're already familiar with on Earth. This is a good reason to be highly suspect of any claims of alien visitations, because aliens are highly unlikely or near impossible to look anything like us. Why? Because aliens on another planet would evolve in a completely different trajectory under a completely different set of environmental conditions and circumstances and are not at all likely to look anything like us, despite what you see in the movies. In fact, they may look so different that we may not even recognize them as life forms at all. So if aliens really did visit us, what would they really look like from a science perspective? The explanation is coming up right now. Guys, before I talk about life on other planets, I want to tell you something great that's available right here on Earth, and that is Magellan TV. If you like my videos, you're going to love Magellan TV. It's a new type of streaming documentary service that I think you'll really enjoy. It was founded by filmmakers and producers who bring premium in-depth documentary content. This video was inspired in part by a documentary that I watched on Magellan TV called Aliens Walk Among Us. It's hosted by none other than Captain Kirk of Star Trek, William Shatner. Featured subjects on Magellan TV include history, nature, and of course, science and space. You can watch it on any of your devices as well as your TV anytime without any ads or any interruptions and in 4K. Magellan TV has a fantastic offer right now for Arvin Ash viewers. If you use the link in the description, you will get a free one month trial. I highly recommend Magellan TV, but be sure to use the link in the description. To understand what life on other planets may be like, first let's look at the raw ingredients that life has to work with in the rest of the universe compared to our solar system. The most common elements in the universe are in order hydrogen, helium, oxygen, neon, nitrogen, carbon, silicon, magnesium, iron, and sulfur. And in our solar system, it's almost exactly the same. So as you can see from this chart, our solar system is essentially made of the same elements that the rest of the universe is made of. So in that sense, there's nothing special about the elements available in our local group of planets and our sun. And the most common elements on Earth are iron, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and carbon. So Earth is composed more of the heavier elements than the rest of the solar system. Why would this be the case? Earth has relatively modest gravity compared to the Sun and some of the heavier planets like Saturn and Jupiter. It's not able to hold on to much hydrogen, helium, and other lighter elements, which tend to float away from its gravity. It should not be surprising then that the lightest elements such as hydrogen or helium would be more concentrated in the Sun and the more massive planets like Jupiter and Saturn. But the key element to life is carbon. Carbon is the backbone of every known biological molecule carbon can form four bonds with other atoms simultaneously. This makes it well suited for long chains of molecules that serve life, such as DNA. Organic chemistry, or the chemistry of life on Earth, is based largely on carbon. Is this unusual? Is this what we would expect to see on other planets of the universe as well? You might look at the composition of Earth and say, well, there's a lot more silicon available on Earth. And if you look at the periodic table, silicon is in the same family of elements as carbon. So why can't alien life be based on silicon? This seems plausible, but when you look more closely at the properties of silicon, you realize why life chose carbon instead of silicon, even though it is about 150 times more abundant. The four bonds in carbon are all about the same strength and stability. With silicon, the first bond is stronger than the rest, so this causes instability of certain chemical reactions with silicon. In other words, 
Carbon is capable of forming large complex chains of molecules like DNA. Silicon is not. It is unstable. So the complexity required for organic chemistry with silicon is just not there. Carbon is also such that its bond with other atoms such as nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen is about the same strength. So it's relatively easy for carbon to react with a variety of other elements. In other words, it is a more reactive atom for chemistry. Silicon is just not as reactive with other elements and not as stable in large molecules. And given that life chose carbon when silicon was much more available to us on Earth, advanced life based on silicon instead of carbon is unlikely. Besides carbon, what does life on Earth have in common? All life uses liquid water as a solvent and adenosine triphosphate or ATP to store and release energy. It's likely that if life on other planets is based on carbon, it will also need some type of energy molecule, either ATP or something similar. But does it necessarily need water? Water is the most abundant compound in the universe. This should come as no surprise because it's made up of hydrogen and oxygen, the first and third most abundant elements in the universe. It's a good solvent because it's liquid over a large temperature range. Everywhere there's water on Earth, life is also there. So life based on water could be quite common. So, so far, it would not be a bad bet to presume that intelligent alien creatures on other planets could be based on carbon chemistry and water. This is not to say that chemistry could not exist in other solvents such as liquid ammonia or methane, which is prevalent, for example, on Titan, one of Saturn's moons. But from what is known about earthly chemistry, it likely would not harbor complex intelligent life. Would aliens be in the same environment as Earth? Probably not identical. But temperature-wise, Earth is unique in the solar system because it is the only planet or moon where water can be found in three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas at the same time. So for example, if you're sailing on a ship on a foggy day and see an iceberg, you're viewing water in all three phases at the same time. There is a critical zone or distance from the star where a planet is not so hot, such as Mercury, where it gets so hot that water boils away, but also not too cold where water freezes. This is crucial for life because liquid water provides the medium or solvent in which complex organic chemistry can take place. This can't happen in ice, and it so happens that the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius, is close to the upper limit of organic chemistry. So if our planet was too hot, organic chemistry would not work. But our alien planet could certainly have a different ratio of water to land, and it could have a different gravity. According to the latest Kepler data, there appears to be many more planets bigger than Earth than there are the same size as Earth. So there's a larger prevalence of so-called super-Earths in our galaxy. These are planets about 1.25 to 2 times the size of Earth, and would have gravity about 2 times to 8 times that of Earth. But it's not known whether they are rocky planets like the Earth and Mars or gas giants like Neptune or Uranus. So for now, let's presume that we would need a planet similar to Earth in size and perhaps 0.9 times to 1.1 times the size of Earth. Given the size of the galaxy with 200 billion stars, such a narrow range of planets would still be plentiful in the millions. So let's look at what life would be like on an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of a Sun-like star based on carbon chemistry and water. To do this, I've teamed up with astrobiology authority and zoologist Bibliridian. Check out their YouTube channel Bibliridian for more stuff like this. Here's him. We can be pretty certain that some of the tendencies we see in organisms on Earth will be universal. Some life forms would gain energy from starlight, like plants, while others would survive by feeding on other organisms, like animals. In the latter case, these life forms would need a way of taking in nutrients and expelling waste, which may take the form of a body cavity with separate openings for feeding and excretion. More complex animals will also have some way of sensing and reacting to their environment, the analogues of eyes, ears, and noses, which would form the equivalent of a nervous system. In particular, eyes have evolved many times among completely unrelated lineages, for example, the eyes of octopuses, scallops, insects, and mammals are all thought to have evolved independently of each other, but still serve the same essential function, so it seems likely that eyes might be common on alien worlds as well. But alien eyes might be sensitive to different wavelengths than our own, since they would adapt for the peak spectrum of their own sun, which may be different than Earth's, 
so they might see the world in a very different variety of colours than we do. They might be able to see into the ultraviolet range like many birds and insects, or to sense infrared to detect the body heat of other animals, like pit vipers or vampire bats. However their eyes work, they would most likely need more than one, since having multiple eyes would allow them to sense direction and depth. Animals on Earth have anywhere from two eyes, like in most vertebrates, to over a hundred like in some bivalves. Another trait found in virtually every lineage of complex animals is a symmetrical body plan. Whether it's radially symmetrical like in starfish and jellyfish, or bilaterally symmetrical like in arthropods and vertebrates. This symmetry is almost always accompanied by cephalization, the concentration of the nervous system and the mouth towards one end of the body, forming a sort of head. So it seems quite likely that, like many animals on Earth, a complex alien body plan would exhibit some form of symmetry and have a distinct head-like region of the body that bears at least two eyes and a mouth. When it comes to intelligent life as we would classify it, the organisms would obviously need a large brain capacity and the ability to learn new information. To form a culture, they would need some way of transmitting learned information from generation to generation, and to communicate and cooperate with other individuals, like a language. Their language might not be based on sound, like human languages are, but perhaps involve other modalities such as movement, like sign language, pheromones, changes in skin colour or texture, or even a combination of all of these. To build the tools and structures necessary for an advanced civilization, they would also need a means to manipulate the environment around them, such as limbs or digits of some sort to handle objects, and probably the ability to perform fine motor movements. These need not be fingers, but anything that can hold objects, perhaps prehensile tentacles tipped with smaller digits. Do they live in the sea, in the clouds of a gas giant, or on land? Using our one data point of Earth, there is no complex life that lives permanently in the atmosphere, and most intelligent species on Earth happen to be on land instead of the sea. You might say, what about dolphins and killer whales? You have to remember that these animals were once land mammals. They went back to live in the sea. That's why they still need to breathe air. Does living on land provide some kind of evolutionary bias towards higher intelligence? According to physics professor Bernard Bates at the University of Puget Sound, aliens with advanced technology would have to be on land because technology needs fire to kickstart it by providing a survival advantage and a way to create advanced hunting tools. This can't happen in water. Light from the sun also does not penetrate as deeply in oceans. There's very little light beyond 200 meters in the ocean. So the energy that ocean creatures have to work with is less than the energy available on land. This makes it harder for larger complex creatures to evolve. Once again, here's Bibliridian. So if an alien species lives on land, it would also need some means of terrestrial locomotion. Limbless creatures might slither like snakes or use muscular ripples like gastropods or worms, but on Earth, both vertebrates and arthropods independently evolved legs, which are much more efficient and allow for greater speed and maneuverability than other forms of locomotion so any land-dwelling aliens would likely do the same if they have suitable structures available to adapt into walking limbs. Having evolved from a four-finned ancestor, most vertebrates have four legs, though some, like humans, kangaroos, and dinosaurs, walk on just two, while arthropods can have anywhere from six to several hundred legs. However, there is a trade-off here when it comes to optimal limb configuration. The more legs an animal has, the more stable it will be, but the more energy will be needed to power and coordinate the limbs, making running less efficient, especially at large body sizes. It could be that large active animals are biased towards a smaller number of legs, though this is difficult to say with any certainty. This trade-off is especially relevant to predators, which need limbs that are specialized for efficient running to catch prey. Often, predation also involves complex behaviors, such as stealth or cooperative hunting, which demands a greater intelligence. In humans, the evolution of a larger brain occurred alongside a shift to a more predatory lifestyle, so intelligent aliens may also descend from predatory ancestors, and therefore might tend to have a smaller number of walking limbs that are designed for efficient high-speed movement. There are probably only so many ways an alien can efficiently see, eat, walk, and communicate. And natural selection, 
on their planet would probably weed out inefficient body plants. How prevalent is intelligent life likely to be in the universe? Dr. Yael Kissel, scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center and other scientists believe that most life in the universe as a whole is likely to be microbial. But does simple life like bacteria inevitably evolve into more complex, intelligent life? Well, it's important to realize that evolution doesn't have any end goal. It simply selects for whatever traits provide an immediate advantage. In fact, in some contexts, evolving to become more intelligent might actually be a detriment to some species. For example, predators such as wolves and big cats have achieved a relatively high level of intelligence compared to other animals. But if they became any more intelligent, the enormous energy demands of supporting a large complex brain may outweigh the benefits it provides, so further intelligence may not be selected for. Human intelligence, which is far beyond any other living thing on Earth, and which needs to be supported by a huge energy investment, not only by our metabolism but also by our culture and technology, may be an aberration and not advantageous outside a very specific set of evolutionary circumstances. So we may be an exception in evolution, or the result of a series of coincidental mutations in our ape genome. But given the vast numbers of planets in the universe, it seems that even if our intelligence is an accident, it takes a long time, requires circumstances like being just the right sized planet located at just the correct distance from its star, having a large moon to balance our seasons, and being in a stable part of the galaxy where we didn't get wiped out by a meteor or gamma burst, we should still have company, intelligent neighbors somewhere. They are likely, however, to be so far away that we may never actually encounter them. Seth Sostak, astronomer at the SETI Institute, believes that our first encounter with aliens will likely not be with carbon-based life, but silicon-based life. He says that because he believes that our first close encounter will not be with biological creatures, but with their highly intelligent machines or probes that use silicon chips for processors. They would have sent these out to the far reaches of the galaxy. This makes sense if you consider that this is also the likely evolution of us here on Earth. We are much more likely to send probes to our nearest neighbor Proxima Centauri 4.5 light years away, for example, than humans. So the next time you see little green men in movies, realize that this is probably fantasy. Life forms that we encounter would be completely different than us. They might be little, they might be green, but they will almost certainly not be men. Guys, if you want more of this stuff, then check out the Bibliridian channel at the link in the description. And if you like this video, give us a like and leave me a question because I try to answer all of them. I will see you in the next video, my friend.